Philadelphia, a chief setting of the story of America, a city known for its toughness, grit, and straightforward attitude. Philly can be hectic. It's rough out here. I came to Philly to see just how deep Islam's roots are in this city, dubbed by some the Mecca of the West. And to discover what American Muslims across the country have to learn from the unique community here. Uh, my name is Saeed. <laughs> this is Abdul Fawaz. This is uh, Mohammed Gisha. This is Ramadan. And my brother, we just. We all have a different background. I'm, my brother's from Libya. We're from, uh, we're from Benin. My brother here named Ramadan. Yeah. He is the most dynamic of all of us. <laughs> he has a lot of energy. He also has moved. He goes like this sometimes. <laughs> this masjid, Al Jamia, it has been around here for very, very long time. I used to, the story is it used to be a theater. A good man has bought the building and has made it a sadaqah to become a masjid, inshallah. Some people say that Philadelphia is a Muslim city, that the culture is very Muslim compared to other places. Uh, do you guys think that's a true um, statement? Well, you know what? Uh, I think this is a really cool question. It's a really great question. I was going to tell you that because uh, first time I came here, I felt like home. That's the first time. Me too. MashaAllah. Me too, like, Allah. I don't know. SubhanAllah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't really. I, I don't know really what it is, but SubhanAllah, I see that there's there's something here special. You know, even though I came from so far in Africa, in Benin and all that stuff, uh, I still feel like I have brothers over here. It's a comfort in the heart. You know what I mean? Like, it, it takes me back to, like, um, you know, I still, I'm still among my brothers. That's very really specific That's, about Philly. We go, yeah. yeah. Any area of zip code where you are, you yeah. will find at least three to four, five yeah. masjids. Even though it's not big, small thing where people gather. Yeah. 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 I remember last time I was driving Uber, I was, search I was searching for a masjid that when I saw a house, um, a lot of people were just in front of the house, outside, outside the door, praying. I just parked my car oh, and oh, stay oh. there and do like... Oh. I think do you feel personally that it's people are more comfortable showing their Islam outwardly here? Yes. Yeah. 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 100%. 100%, yeah. I believe the Muslim community here uh, has a long history. Uh, and, and you can walk in the city, in center city of Philadelphia, and you can find Muslims with the thobe, sisters with yeah. their hijab and with their niqab, and they're walking around. They won't feel any strange or any, or any uh, problems with themselves. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the Islamic Place. We've been in the city of Philadelphia since 1989. And um, this, the question that you asked about what's unique about the Muslims in the city of Philadelphia, um, I think they're a lot different than the Muslim communities elsewhere in the country. There's no shyness about being a Muslim in this city. Um, most of the families in the city of Philadelphia either have a family member who is a Muslim or you know or have a cousin or someone related to them which has a link to Islam. So I've been walking through the area feels like West Philly is basically a Muslim town. I guess what they say is true. Uh, you know you just walk down the street you got a beard people start saying Salaam Alaikum you see all the shops all the restaurants the bookstores it's really cool to see. I had the opportunity to spend some time with the esteemed Sheikh and born and bred Philly native, Dr. Tahir Wyatt. The Sheikh is now the director of United Muslim Masjid in South Philly, coming from Medina where he studied for 21 years and eventually taught as the first Westerner ever to teach at Medina University. Uh, on this side of you, um, this is the yard of the Philadelphia Masjid. Um, as you can see, it's overgrown. <laughs> Uh, needs to be tended to, but it's actually, inshallah, the site of uh, future development. So, and then you come up on the masjid here, um, which is a little over 45,000 square feet. It's a very large masjid. Right, 45,000 square feet is a lot. And Sister Claire Muhammad Park right here. Um, um, and this is the rest of the school side here. There's a dojo in there, some other stuff. Um, interestingly enough, and this is this takes it. This is a lot more history you would have to cover. Do you see this? This right here is also a masjid. You're just having, see, see where it says Kuba Institute? Yeah. I don't know if you peeped yeah, that, yeah, I see the that second yeah. floor. Yeah, so so this used to be called the uh, um, 
International. What was it called, Sheikh Mukhtar? Yes. International Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. This was like one of the first messages in the city. So we're riding it down Lancaster Avenue. Uh, we just came from 47th in Lancaster. Up here is 43rd. I'm going to take you to another message, um, which is uh, right off of 41st in Lancaster. Mm -hmm. You got it? Um, so it's deceptively larger than it looks like because there's just this, all you see is the front, mm -hmm. right? The, it's a very long building. I see. And on the back side of the building, there's an entrance for the Shumps Clinic. So it's there's a, actually a free clinic run by the Muslims. Um, for as you and, and it's for the underinsured and the uninsured. This is one of the most forty uh, first in Lancaster is one of the most dangerous corners um, in this police district mm. uh, because we do have some anti violence initiatives. Uh, we kind of get like. The, uh, the stats on where stuff is actually going down. I see. What kind so, of violence is, is Oh, murders and okay. uh, attempted murders. Yeah. In, in this city, if, if you're a Muslim and you you look like a Muslim and you, you don't look like you're playing games, right? Because yeah. uh, it, it, as, as Dr. Mukhtar said, it is an extra layer of protection from random stupidity, mm. right? And that's due to the efforts of the early Muslims, right? I, I, I give that credit squarely to those uh, early Muslims, who met many of them who um, were in gangs prior to coming to Islam, and then they came yeah. to Islam, they reformed their lives, yeah. right? And they adopted that moral code of Islam, and they took that back to the streets. Mm. So people did respect the Muslims. I mean, they respected the Muslims for, for multiple things. Number one, because they saw people really trying to live a life that was pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They left off all of the, the street stuff. Mm -hmm. But also because they know that there's gonna be a different type of retaliation if you, you know, you approach a Muslim sister or you do something to the, a Muslim brother who wasn't involved in that kind of life. Why are you targeting us? There's gonna be a different type of retaliation because these are not guys who are just gonna lay down. So we're not pacifists, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're going to uh, do the best of our ability to, to defend ourselves. Exactly. You know, and not be the aggressors, but also not just lay down. And sometimes, subhanAllah, just to, uh, just the threat of retaliation will will keep the attack from happening, mm. right? Which yeah. is important. Yeah, it's actually a Quranic concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Allah Jalla in, in the Quran, when He tells the Muslims, "Wa idu lahum mastatatu min kubu," yani prepare, uh, make that preparation, get uh, what you can of strength, of might, right? Not so that you can go out and be the aggressor. But because if people know that you are prepared, then a lot of times that's enough to keep the peace. Yeah. The, the other thing that, um, so like this is where it goes down. You see we're in 41st in Lancaster yeah. over here? Yeah, there's a lot of activity there at night. Not the good kind of activity. No, 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 <laughs> not good activity. <laughs> so how do Muslims get caught up in this? Like, is there some, there must be some sort of cognitive dissonance going on if, they're going to the masjid, they want to pray, they want to fast, but then they're so entrenched in the lifestyle that it's hard for them to leave, especially when there's few opportunities. So, I think that what happens is, um, it, it, generally, you, can, you can't actually, I don't even think it's cognitive dissonance, man. I, I think that what's happening is, you're dealing with people who have taken shahada, um, maybe not have fully recognized Iman in their hearts, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Bedouins in Surah Al-Hujurat. Qalat al-Arabu Amanna. Yani the, the Bedouins, they say, you know, we have Iman. Kullam tu'minu, walakin kulu aslamna. Walakin lamma yadukhul al-Imanu fi kulubikum. Don't say that we have Iman, say that we have accepted Islam, yeah. right? We have submitted to, to some degree. Yeah. But Iman, that, that full Iman has not truly entered into your hearts. And so, what you see happening here? Look at look at what we're doing. Look, I mean, this, this is what time is it? Like three o'clock or something like that? I mean, yeah. and this is not nighttime. Yeah. So, so, okay. How do you not become a product of your environment? Yeah. How are you not a product of your environment? Yeah. So, so even even the best of the best 
if you sit in this stuff long enough, yeah. you got music coming from over here. I'm talking about the, and then, you know, they get that drill music and the stuff that's just encouraging you to kill people and, yeah. you know, um, and, and, and everything going on, and drugs being sold right there, prostitutes down the street. Like, how are you not affected by that environment? It's not cognitive dissonance. It's that, like, we as the Muslims actually have to either do better at, at affecting these environments, right? Yeah. At coming in and cleaning things up. You know Big Palau. Just pull, pull the door. There's so many uh, narrations, you know, from the early scholars of Islam that talk about learning edab, right, before you learn knowledge and all this other yes. stuff. And now you actually see practically how you got these people that get all this information, right? They might live in Tupelo, Mississippi. It's not even a mess. No Muslim community. They're getting this information. They don't know how to process it. That's all it really is, is information. And they use it to battle other people. Like, oh, debate. It's also, it's another part to that, 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 com that complex problem is parenting. We, have, we come from parenting. We come from older men that was men and establish their home and establish their families and establish their women and their children. We're forced to live in a society where both parents have to work. It's not just his salary. It's not just the wife's salary. We got to both work. So if we both have to work to establish a house, who takes care of the children? You got to send them to a daycare with people that don't even want their own kids. In the 80s, when I first really started, the barber shop was the family structure. It was the it was the uh, community center of of life. Fathers was here with their children, and they would talk about basketball, football, whatever current events, politics. It was it was a family thing, and then it started becoming more women bringing the kids to the shop. Maybe because fathers wasn't available, whatever the situation may have been, but it started changing. Even when I was growing up, it. It would be pretty common for a person to think that, I mean, especially in the hood, to think that, you know, by the time they were 21, they were either going to either going to be dead or in jail, right? That number now is like down to like 15. By the time he's 15, he'll be dead in or in jail. And a lot of them don't even think about being in jail. They just think they're going to be dead. Um, like when, when when that level of hopelessness. Right is combined with life not really having value. You get that recipe for disaster. We just talked about, I, honestly, that they talked about five different shoes. Like you were saying back in the day when you you had that that feeling that at 21 you might not make it. But at at the same token, back then in those 80s, those early 80s, the hoodlum, the hoodlum type of guy that, or the hood type of guy, or the person you thought that was the bad guy, they used to protect the kids. Like they, they, they would tell you, young boy, get off the corner. This ain't for you. Young boy, go to school. Give them money. Here, take this money, go to the store. They would clean the neighborhood. They would, they would protect even the, the kid that was like the bookworm, who was studious. They used to protect them. They would go at each other because they knew who each other was. That That's the major problem now. Back then, we knew who was the hoodlum. We knew who was the drunk boy. We knew who was the, 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 the robber and shooter. We knew who everybody was. Now we're at an age where these kids, you can't recognize who no one is because they all have the possibility of anything because of the hopelessness and the lack of, of, of wanting to live the lack of religion, whatever religion, the, the lack of the, the lack of believing in a God. What what was a time like a situation where you were like you were questioning like how 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 am I gonna keep my my hope alive? Like how am I gonna avoid despairing? It was uh, July of 2019. I sat on the toilet. I thought I cleaned it out. I sat on the toilet for two minutes. Within a week, I had three bumps next to my hamstring, on my hamstring. Then in another week, it was the size of in my leg. You can grab it just like, like this. I go to the hospital. I wake up 
four days later, I was uh, I had an emergency surgery. I found that I had a triple stab infection. They cut six by nine out my hamstring and left it wide open and debris. They emergency surgery. They stuffed it. They gave me three different antibiotics. So I wake up with tubes hanging out my neck. I wake up. It, it's all this is going on, and my leg. They they stuffing it with gauze. I had I, it was. I was in a coma for three days. Wow. They wanted to take take my leg. My wife wouldn't let them. I'm the so they debriefed it and left it open. So I had to wear a wound back wow. for uh, four months. So I get out the hospital, I'm going to dialysis, but in my head I'm like, I didn't question God. What I did was I said, what have I done to be clean like this here? But I knew I was bodyguarding, I was sleeping two hours a night for 15 years, I was sick. It was bad. I wasn't sitting down. I was moving. I was going. So I said, he set me down. What did he set me down for? So now this is where the hope had to come in. Because now I, I said, I have to get better. Because I was sitting here. I, I needed help. For the first time in my life, I needed help. I used to lift crazy weights. I was, I was able to pick up a car. I was, I was, I was strong. Now I couldn't do a, a, a push -in. When They told my wife I was going to wake up a vessel. If you see me now, I'm not a vessel. Seventeen times a day, on average, you ask to be treated like those that, that are all love. Who do we love? And what do they go through? Probably like some said the people who face the hardest tests are the MBF, and then those who are most like them face difficult tests, right? And you're asking to be like them. Something that comes to mind with me regarding tests is that a lot of times we hear about tests and we start getting scared. Like, I'm scared. Like, what's gonna happen? Like, I don't want to go through that. But when you're actually put in the test, you rise to the occasion. You, you're patient, you know? If you overthink the test, right, you won't even challenge yourself, subhanAllah. So you, you got to give you, subhanAllah, go into it with that, with, with true tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really relying upon Him. And Allah has to make it easy. A lot of times, if you know what the end game is, you're willing to go through the test to get there, right? If, if you could just imagine yourself in Jannah, then ask yourself, what are you willing to go through to get there? I don't know. I started getting my hood stuff. I said, I want to go to Allah. You better to God through. My name is Regan Boy from North Philadelphia. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Saad. What do you like today, the Marouche? Really nice sauce. Um, Mediterranean flavors on the chicken. Parsley, tomatoes, pickles. It's like a shawarma, but in a nice toasted uh, bun. Goes great together. I like the crunch on the bun. Has a good uh, texture. All goes well together. So, so uh, growing up in North Philly, which is a more rougher area of town, I would say. For sure. Um, what led to that situation where you were shot seven times? I don't want to say more so me in the streets. I want to say wrong place, wrong time. You know what I mean? <clears throat> me. Uh, I was leaving somewhere, picking up a female, and it literally just happened just like that. I think somebody thinking I'm somebody else. They thought you were somebody else. Yeah, like that's how I flew up it. But everybody in Philadelphia is on edge. I don't know if you see, you can see. Yeah. Everybody walks around me and face. Like you be like, oh, what's wrong with him? Just last year we had over 800 more <clears throat> murders. Like that's not normal. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But where we're from is normalized. You see, because it happened so rapidly. You see, what I'm saying I lost my brother, sister, two brothers, and it's like life, life moves on. I mean, that's how everybody is in Philly. You see, what I'm saying. What is the root cause of the violence? The root cause of the violence is right now. I'm gonna say the music. The music you 
say that? Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's a it's a wave of drill music mm. where I'm from this neighborhood, you're from this neighborhood. Um, you diss my damn homies, I diss your dead homies, and uh, that's how that's how it is right now. Like people are pissed off about it. Somebody talk about somebody that that, that, that one of your loved ones that died. <clears throat> That's how they retaliate with death. You no. see what I'm saying? Do you feel like America abandoned Philadelphia? For sure. I, um, when you get a chance, go down Kensington Allegheny. I don't know if you heard of it. Yeah, but it's terrible. Like I'm talking about, like they, they call it zombie land, and uh, you can see for yourself why they call it. That. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a Percocet epidemic. Uh, yeah, for sure. The whole city is on purpose. So it's a prescribed medicine for pain. Uh, you know, a lot of people in Philadelphia have been shot. It's like it's to the point that you can't be from Philadelphia and get shot. Like, seriously, if you haven't been shot, you can't. <laughs> Look, seriously, like that's how really people say it. So, so people get hooked on it naturally. Or yeah, that's an addictive, strong medicine where half of the city was on it, then they abuse it, yeah. and now it's an epidemic, and they go from Percocets to heroin. Mm -hmm. And um. Unfortunately, that's that's what's going on. A good friend of mine, uh, you can look him up. His name is uh, K Dot, K Dot the Showstopper. I mean, he was around Rick Ross, Meek Mill. Yeah. Now he's on the streets of Kenneth and uh, yeah. heroin. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so it started from Percocets. You know what I'm saying? And, you, and also, that's another thing that the rapper culture has uh, normalized taking Percocets. Yeah. It's like in all the songs. Yeah. Right, this is, is, is what the kids listening to. Yeah. And then and they come to find out the person that's saying it doesn't even take those drugs. You have been shot. Um, what was, uh, I mean, you were fighting for your life. You were in the, you were in, in the hospital for like nine months, right? Yeah, You were on YouTube, so everything. Yeah. What, what sort of emotions do you have now thinking about that whole ordeal, that whole experience? SubhanAllah. I'm, I'm living. <laughs> yeah, I mean, alhamdulillah, like, I'm living. I had a chance to live. I had a chance to um, bring other, other of my brothers to Islam. Um, I think about the positives. There's too much negatives to think about negatives. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, you're here. Alhamdulillah. And it's like, a wise man told me, <clears throat> You'll be a fool. I mean, it's, 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 you could trip over something that's in front of you, but you'll be a fool to trip on something that's behind you. So it's like, why would I trip on something that's already, you know what I mean? I'm living. Like, I didn't see my mom cry. I didn't see people die. I lost friends in the hospital around that time. I didn't miss birthdays. You know what I'm saying? So I can't trip on that. I got to worry about the future and, and the purpose the law has for me. Dr. Mukhtar Curtis is a Philly native who spent 20 years working as a chaplain in federal prisons. Prison environment is a uh, predatory environment. That means that there has to be a group for an individual to join in order to protect himself from predatory people whether it be forced homosexuality, whether it be protection, whether it be money, an individual by himself, it is my opinion, will not be able to survive without being taken advantage of. The growth of Islam has provided an alternative to the traditional gang membership within that prison. I asked Dr. Mukhtar about some of the more memorable moments in his career. What happened, so I walked into the recreation area on my way to my office, and I thought somebody called me, Chaplain Curtis, Chaplain Curtis. And somebody was calling me. So when I got down to the area where I thought somebody was, I didn't see any Sunni Orthodox Muslims. So I asked one of the guys there, I knew him, but I wasn't close to him, so to speak. So I said, did you call me? And he literally cussed me out. He, I mean, you know, expressing how much, he, he got the chance to express how much he didn't like me. Curse words and all. So I didn't say anything, I just walked away. Next day I'm coming to work. And so I'm getting ready to walk into the building outside, 
from out from the outside rec area. And right at the door was this same inmate that cussed me out the day before. He said, hello, Chaplain Curtis. How are you? Is there anything I can do for you? Everything all right? So what do you think happened? Well, a day or two later, one of the inmates said somebody stepped to him. And of course, in parlance, that means one way or another, uh, you might have to pay for what you did. To defend an employee to other inmates is no small matter. When I transferred after 17 years to three years to a penitentiary, although I didn't know it, my reputation preceded me. When I got to the prison, the new, new prison, one of the inmates, Muslim inmates, said, let's uh, take a walk. And all we did was uh, walk the perimeter of the outside rec area, which is about as big as one or two football fields. And he just walked with me. I later came to understand that he wanted the people to know, you mistreat Chaplain Curtis, you have to stand up for it to some of the inmates. Has there been harm caused in the Muslim community from people who bring the, the instincts cultivated by the predatorial environment of prison into the Muslim communities outside of prison? Yes, I've been insulted at certain masjids because I wasn't part of their group. You know, I went there maybe for prayer. But what I have noticed is that at these types of masjids, and I'm not going to elaborate, I have seen suggestions of the most heinous type of sins, the attitude where it's allowed, if something that the law really hates is talked about in a favorable way or done, and none of the regular members of that mindset do or say anything. That tells me a whole lot. But it also tells me, uh, I also form the opinion that they're segregated, whether they know it or not, mm -hmm. from the Muslim community in general. I have a saying that it's, it, it's very difficult to fake being a believer. Once you practice it, you're able to see who's really practicing. And so the people who are very, very arrogant, the people who are very, very uncompromising, the people who basically think that they are the only ones who are really true Muslims, in of itself exposes you. Unfortunately, I have found that much com many conversations are devoted to something negative that mm -hmm. somebody isn't doing, whether it be, they be Muslim or, or not. That is a sign. Focusing on people's flaws people's institutions, countries, period. Hmm. I have a theory that people like to put other Muslims down because subconsciously makes them feel like they are in a better place. It's like a ladder where by pushing one person one rung down, that makes you one rung above. Instead of putting in the work to climb, they put other people down to leave themselves at a higher place. I'm glad to try a real Philly because they didn't have that sides, unfortunately. But alhamdulillah, we're here and uh, we're gonna get a real taste of what they're like. Not the off-brand versions I've had in other cities. Bismillah. It's just nice when they put a lot of steak in it, you know. A lot of other places like to fill it up with lettuce and tomatoes and sometimes you just want a Philly that's just a bunch of, you know, cut up steak and cheese. That's all you want. Perfectly cooked. It's still moist. It's not dry. It's moist. Um, you got sautéed onions mixed in, a bunch of cheese, mayo. So 
This is how you do Philly's right. Something that people get wrong about Philly cheesesteaks is that they expect some type of gourmet meal or something like that. Like, this is a... Uh, this is working people's food, you know? You, do, you need to fill your belly. Don't expect it to be a three-course meal. <laughs> you know, we, want, we need some meat, we need some bread. And it's become a cultural institution of the city. There's a reason the Philly cheesesteak spread so quickly in the city because it's a working class city. I met back up with Dr. Tahir to attend a aqiqah that he was invited to in Southwest Philly. Um, this, by the way, uh, is Mesa Al Wasatiya. The name is West African. It's very diverse, like in terms of the uh, the actual people who pray at the masjid. Uh, what does that mean? So Al Wasatiya means you know traveling a middle course. Mm -hmm. The itidal is is balanced. Mm -hmm. So it's like the middle and balanced. Middle and balanced. <laughs> This is my Akika and then I'm here. Mashallah. We're doing it big over your feet. So we pulled up to uh, Akika of a West African brother. Um, and they're serving some traditional West African stew. It's got fish, uh, goat liver, goat tripe um, stomach. Um, so it's a very diverse stew of uh, uh, mystery meats, la over red beans and uh, and rice. So we're gonna give it a try this one. <laughs> has a spicy flavor with um, strong fish taste from the stew. It's cooked in with the bones and everything, so let's try the liver. Look at the look at the It's cooked very nicely and good. after being here for 21 years you say wow you know what makes you come back to to this like yeah. look <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like who, who wants to come back to to this after you lived in the city of the Prophet? I so I I don't think the answer is that difficult. You know what is it that pushed the Sahaba? You know many of them to leave Medina and die in Kufa and, and Damascus and yeah. you know Egypt and other places. Tunisia, like, was, and yeah, Dagestan. What, I, it seems to me, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but what pushed them was the desire to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before I left the city, there was a painting at the Philadelphia Museum of Art that I thought was worth seeing. This man right here, Yara Mamut, is an incredible man. He was actually a slave who was brought over from Guinea. And he was known to be an Arabic speaker, fluent. So people thought that he must have been a rich man because he was um, fluent in a, in a language, reading and writing. In fact, he was a very strong practicing Muslim. And when he came to America, um, when they forced him on the grueling trip over the ocean to work his life away, he stuck to his faith. He kept the dhikr on his tongue. He kept the iman in his heart. And 40 years later, he won his freedom and he was known to be a very cheerful man who gave da'wah to people who sang the praises of God in the street as they had mentioned and uh, he was known for his sobriety so all these signs tell us he was a very strong Muslim and through 40 years of hard labor he maintained his faith 
the reason we know about him is it's a crazy story. The man who painted him, Charles Peel, was a very famous artist and he only drew famous people. He drew President Andrew Jackson, President James Monroe. But the reason he drew this man who might have been insignificant otherwise is someone told him that he was 130 years old. And this man, Charles Peel, wanted to know his secret to long life so he can do it himself. But Yara was actually 84 at the time. I feel like Allah had decreed that Charles Peel was going to find him and paint him so that we know his story because otherwise he would have faded into obscurity. In his obituary it reads, It is known to all that knew him that Yaro was an industrious, honest, and moral man. He was known to be the greatest swimmer in the Potomac River. And he was known to also have had so many skills making nets, baskets, and other items for sale. He had a great business sense, and he saved a lot of money and freed his son as well. So Yaro Muhammad is just an inspiring figure in our American Islamic history. And he's proof that Islam was practiced on these shores long before my parents and the immigrants came. I leave Philadelphia with a sense of sadness because the Muslims I met here were some of the most genuine, sincere, and humble people I've ever met. Get through the hard exterior that this city demands and come see for yourself why this community is so special.